Hi everyone, my name is Kate. I'm also known as Plum Workshop and today I will be giving a presentation on garage kits. This was originally a panel presentation that I gave at the convention KatsuCon 2023, but I received a lot of feedback from people who wanted this as a separate recording or they weren't able to make it to the con, so I decided to record this separately. It will be a little bit longer than the original presentation, mainly because that one included a live demonstration uh, as well as a Q&A session and so we'll be having some fun here. So this is the outline of our presentation. Uh, this will be very old school, kind of no clickbait, nothing like that. Um, this is about a 40 minute presentation. So uh, we're first gonna cover what my background is. Uh, you know, why am I the one talking to you guys about kits? Uh, we'll then talk about garage kit history as well as how to purchase authentic garage kits, very important. And then we'll talk about essential supplies that I use on every kit um, in this hobby. And finally wrap up with basic preparation steps. I have a lot of photos and visual aids that I'm going to show you guys, so hopefully that will make for an informative and kind of engaging presentation. So who exactly am I? Um, I am Plum Workshop. I am a garage kit artist with over 10 years experience building and painting garage kits. This figure here on the right is the first figure that I ever painted all the way back in 2010. So I've been at this for a very long time. Um, I'm also known as Munto on my figure collection. So if you've ever Googled how to build a garage kit or you've gone on there, you've probably come across my username um, or encountered one of my tutorials. I have several things that I really like. Um, I enjoy building chibi kits. I'm kind of known mostly for cute stuff. Uh, plants, art, and I love indie music. That's kind of a side, side passion of mine, um, seeking out new music. And my career is actually completely unrelated to figure building. Um, and I put this here because I have received questions and kind of feedback from people who don't think they have what it takes to build these kits. Um, and my answer is always that anybody can get into this hobby. It's a lot of fun. Um, all you need is kind of a passion and to love kind of hands on work. And so don't let any of that stop you if you don't come from an art background or you didn't go to art school or anything like that. So this slide is uh, not just showing you guys all how old I am, um, but really to kind of demonstrate that over time, kit building has really become more and more popular. Um, and back when I started in 2010, uh, really the only way to get involved was to join a forum board community. Uh, and we also had nowhere near the amount of resources and proxies or uh, YouTube guides or even materials to buy um, and ways to obtain these kits. And so things have changed a lot uh, in this time frame. Which which is also why I felt it was necessary to make this video. So I've already been talking about garage kits, uh, but what exactly are they? Uh, we are typically talking about unpainted, unassembled resin kits, and I put a star here, kind of a, an asterisk, because historically that hasn't always been the case. Um, they have been made of different material, and we also have some interesting new things like 3D printing, which is becoming more popular, uh, so that kind of is including all of those at this point. But Typically, uh, these are figurines cast in a silicone mold um, by sculptors or circles in their workshops or garages. That's kind of where the nickname came from. These are figures that require preparation, painting, and assembly. So they'll come in a bag or a box um, in pieces and you're required to do all of the work on these figures. And it's really not just cute anime girls. Uh, these include many genres, many characters, really anything you can think of, it could be made into a kit. And so there's really something here for everybody. And to kind of demonstrate that, I just wanted to show a couple of different photos of kits. Uh, none of these are mine, but you can see here that, you know, we have beautiful ladies, handsome men. There are some kits that are designed specifically for beginners. And so this top uh, middle image of Asuna from Sword Art Online, this is actually made of color resin. And so um, all you really need to do is all of the prep work and you can basically skip, uh, skip the painting phase and go straight to assembly. They're designed more for beginners. We also have uh, stylized animals, kind of sci-fi type kits, and even ones with more realistic face sculpts. So all of those, all of these are garage kits. Um, and just kind of as a side note, um, in the past couple of years, we've been in this hobby kind of increasingly seeing Chinese sculpts, um, you know, by Chinese artists, and these have been available for sale. Uh, this has not always been the case. Uh, really, we usually talk about these in a Japanese context, um, given all of the figures that come out of Japan, um, but I thought it was worth mentioning because a lot of these really nice sculpts are starting to come out of China. 
And so garage kits have a really interesting history that kind of dates all the way back to the 1950s and 60s. Um, and during this time, injection mold and kind of plastic model kits were really popular. Um, these are not garage kits technically, but I felt it was important to kind of put them here for the context and framing the story was as we move forward. In the 1980s, um, so kind of as time is going by, we're seeing the rise of several different genre, um, the tokusatsu and kaiju genre, so things like uh, live action, Ultraman, Godzilla, as well as Gundam are becoming more popular. Um, the first Gundam figure came out in 1980, so these hobbies are kind of evolving at the same time. The material in the 80s for these uh, figures was typically soft vinyl, but you were also seeing resin figures, um, and a resin eventually became the predominant material uh, mostly because it increased in popularity, it's kind of more stable to work with, it can handle uh, kind of more different types of paint, so it became more popular. In the 90s, uh, again, these are becoming more popular and we're starting to see licensed characters being made. Uh, these are often kits by very well-known companies, so if you collect PVC, you've probably heard of Kotobukiya or Volks, Kaioto. Um, these were actually figure companies that were producing resin kits at that time. and so. Um, that's fun. <laughs> and then during this time frame, we also are seeing the rise of figure festivals. And I will go into this, uh, but in short, these are in-person events for the most part, uh, where artists uh, go to a convention center and they sell the sculpts that they have created to artists who want to paint these figures. So there are figure festivals happening. The 1990s through the 2010s kind of blurred together. Um, we're really still seeing these circles that are participating in festivals, as well as sculptors, uh, excuse me, sculpts by manufacturers. Um, although these are becoming less common, mostly because PVC figures, so these pre-painted figures, are becoming more popular. Uh, interestingly, the 2000s and 2010s is kind of the rise of the internet. And so historically, um, we really didn't have access and ways to figure out or find out about these figures. Um, it was typically shown in magazines, so they would print magazines um, to you know, show what figures are coming out, and a lot of this was through word of mouth. But the internet changed that because now artists can make blogs, you know, documenting their progress and their sculpts. They can say, hey, I'm going to Wonder Festival. You know, there's different ways of communicating that. Um, there's also this first glimpse into the community uh, through an international lens. So this is when I joined and was starting to find out about this hobby. Um, so really we're getting that kind of glimpse in. The late 2010s to kind of now have really changed things even more, um, mostly because social media has become so popular. So we're really seeing this kind of international popularity. Um, hashtags are being used to you know, show off figures. We have easier access, um, you know, via the internet and ways we can purchase through different sites. And we even have online festivals, which I'll talk about. And so it is so much easier to find out information about these kids today. You can watch step by step tutorials on YouTube. Uh, really, things have never been easier in terms of getting into this hobby. So garage kits are still predominantly sold at figurine festivals, and the two most popular are Wonder Festival as well as Treasure Festival. Um, I know there's often a lot of confusion about you know, these types of things, um, but in short, to kind of break it down, through these festivals, artists apply for a one-day license, which allows them to sell the figures at these festivals. And it is illegal for them to sell these licensed and copyrighted characters outside of that date. Um, and so because of that, a lot of these figures are very limited and exclusive to Japan. Um, they are typically cast uh, or made in a very small number, uh, usually between 10 to 30 copies per figure. But this can really vary a lot depending on how popular a sculptor is, you know, how many times they go to that event, if they're very well known, um, all sorts of things. So. Um, to kind of get around this general limitation, some artists do sculpt original characters, which are uh, characters that are not bound to any sort of license, uh, which allows them to sell their figures year round. And a lot of artists do display their works at these festivals in hope of future employment, either being scouted by a figure company directly at the festival, uh, or even having the rights to their figure bought outright so it can be made into a PVC figure. That's sometimes why you see garage kits get made suddenly into PVC. It's because the rights have been purchased. 
So I actually had the opportunity to visit Wonder Festival uh, in 2019 before coronavirus hit. And so I wanted to show everyone kind of a few photos of the event and what it actually is like. And so this top left photo here, this is called the Wonder Festival Guidebook. It's essentially a book that you buy uh, that is your ticket into the event. And it has a list of every single sculptor and booth that is going to be at Wonder Festival. And so what happens is you buy this book and you kind of go through it and highlight uh, the convention hall floor and plan your route throughout the floor because a lot of these kits sell out really quickly so if there's something you really want you have to kind of get there as early as you can. The bottom left photo here this is before the convention hall opens so everyone gets up very early. Um, the convention center opens at 10 in the morning or at least it did uh, back when I was there um, and so this is around 7 or 8 a.m. and it's already lined up all all the way around the building um, so everyone gets there and just kind of waits nice and quiet in line um, and then at 10 a.m. they filter people in and then you just walk the halls and so uh, these are some photos that I took when I was at Wonder Festival um, you can see here they have the price listed so you can just buy the unpainted figure uh, from these artists and there's also some interactive kind of exhibits that you can take photos and stuff at and so this uh, photo in the top right here is me posing with all of my loot from that year as well as one of the Wonder Festival mascot girls that was their costume for the year that ch uh, changes throughout the years. So that's an amazing opportunity, um, but there's kind of a sad reality behind all of this, and that's that garage kit artists uh, and sculptors very rarely make a profit from this work. Um, they can spend millions of yen in terms of production costs. There's the time of sculpting the figure. There's all the licensing and travel fees to get to the event, as well as other fees. And so as fellow artists, we do have a responsibility to ethically support these artists as much as we can and to kind of keep this hobby going. And so for the next couple slides, I'm going to show you guys ways to purchase authentic garage kits. So seeing that you are probably not all going to be booking a ticket to go right to Japan and go to Wonder Festival, uh, the majority of kits that you will be purchasing will have been sold second hand. And so in other words, someone had that kit and they're getting rid of it for whatever reason. Maybe they don't want to have a bit build it anymore, maybe they don't have time, but either way it's second hand. And so thankfully there are some Japanese sites that do sell these kits internationally. Um, Mandarake as well as Hobby Shop Jungle are two very popular websites where you just use that URL and you can browse an English website and add kits to your cart and check out and then you're good to go. They'll ship them straight to you eBay and Mercari are two other kind of secondhand routes um, through, you know, people who are wanting to offload their stuff. Um, these have a caveat or two, which I'll talk about shortly, um, but this can be a good way to find some stuff. Um, I also didn't list my figure collection, but, you know, there's always people trying to get rid of their kits through there as well. And I have also listed some of my old kits on there um, prior to using, you know, eBay or any other site. Uh, for the most part though, a lot of these sites I'm just about to show you require the use of a proxy or a forwarder. Uh, these are basically companies that will help you navigate the Japanese language um, and kind of these websites and purchase the kits for you and either ship it directly to you or kind of go through um, a proxy service. And so I actually have a whole guide on how to do this on my website, so I'm not going to go through, you know, how to do this in depth, but I did want to show you guys some of the sites uh, that you can buy from to obtain original figures. And so kind of starting from the top left here, we have Yahoo Auctions. This is essentially Japanese eBay um, where people put up their stuff that they're selling that they don't want anymore. Uh, sometimes you see pre-painted garage kits that people have painted and they're trying to turn a profit on. Uh, people sell their stuff after the event, although these can be quite high um, due to the kind of exclusivity and getting it right after the event. Um, so that's a fun route. Uh, Sudagaya and Rakuten, these are kind of like Amazon warehouse type stores. So there's lots of smaller shops um, and they list garage kits on there. And so you can find um, some random things there, kind of secondhand stuff. Maybe you'll get lucky and, and get something there. The bottom two are interesting because these do support the sculptor directly. So the first is Pixiv Booth. So Pixiv, kind of like the illustration site, um, they have this other site called Booth. And this they advertise themselves as an indie marketplace. And what happens is these artists, these garage kit artists, um, 
make a shop on Booth and they're able to sell their works on there. And so they can sell their original characters um, as well as some licensed characters uh, that have kind of looser uh, licensing restrictions. They are allowed to sell on Booth. Uh, so that's a great way to obtain an original kit. Um, the other one, this last one here on the bottom right, this is actually a figure festival. So this is Treasure Festival Online. It moved online uh, around COVID era, so 2019, 2020-ish. Um, and since then, it has been online every couple of months. And so all you really need um, is an international credit card, a forwarder, um, and just an ab a small ability to navigate Japanese language. Um, and you can buy directly from these festivals. Um, and so... This is a fantastic way to obtain quite a few licensed properties. Um, you know, Fate Grand Order is often very popular on there, Uma Musume, a lot of ship girls. And so this is a fantastic option if you're looking for licensed characters. Um, I had nothing like this when I was starting out this hobby. So I would really recommend uh, checking that out if you're interested in a lot of the popular kind of upcoming things. So unfortunately, um, I do have to address kind of the less savory part of this hobby, and that's the fact that recast or bootleg garage kits exist. So just like PVC uh, bootlegs, there are also bootlegs of garage kits. And there are several companies that exist where their entire business model is to produce illegal copies of these authentic kits for profit. Because again, an original kit is only valid for the day of sale at that event, unless it's has, you know, kind of a looser license like an original character or something. And so E246 and GKM, these are two of the most popular sites that people buy from. Uh, these are also some of the first things that you see, the first websites when you Google, like buy garage kit. And so they essentially take advantage of people who are interested and uh, are novices to this hobby who don't know any better or don't know anything about this hobby. Um, and they're also seen as quite attractive. Um, they're cheaper, they're mass produced, you're getting that character you want. Um, but unfortunately, they do really hinder the creators and this hobby as a whole. Uh, you will basically be blacklisted if it's found out that you're supporting and buying these recasts in Japan. Uh, so if you intend to join this hobby seriously, I would very much advise you not to take this route um, because it kind of leaves a stain on you as a modeler, if I'm being completely honest here. Um, you know, a lot of us in the Western sphere do have that stain, um, and that's just kind of how it is. So the most we can do is to try to support these original um, kind of peak uh, characters and, and kits that are coming out of Japan. Um, and just to kind of wrap this up, uh, I wanted to talk about this photo a little bit. So this is a typical recast listing. This is a, from a guide my friend Toshki made on how to tell the original and uh, bootleg difference. And so what we have here is kind of this really nicely laid out parts list with numbers and this clean white resin. This is quite unusual. Um, original kits do not look like this. Um, you know, no one really does it like this. Um, they may have, you know, the pieces in a bag. There may be an item code attached to it or a lower price. All of that is indicative of a bootleg. And these are on Yahoo auctions. They're kind of everywhere. So uh, just be aware when you are shopping and looking for kits that you want uh, that you don't end up buying a recast as a mistake. And so now we're going to kind of cue into a different part of this uh, presentation, which goes into actually building. And so I tend to break uh, down kit building into three different stages. The first stage is preparation. So getting that figure nice and smooth and sanding it and, you know, filling all the gaps and, and getting it ready uh, so it's able to be painted. And then we have the actual painting step where you're doing all of the, the work, either with a you know, paintbrush or an airbrush. And then finally the assembly step, which is really just kind of gluing it together and putting it on the base. Um, and so these next few slides I'm gonna show you guys are uh, basically what I term essential supplies on how to build a kit. Um, so before I start, uh, really there's kind of dozens of products available to build kits. It's a very flexible hobby. So uh, my advice um, is to be skeptical and critical of people who tell you you need to have X product or to buy this because it's a must-have, etc. Um, do your research. You know, make, 
it's really kind of the startup costs, it can be as high as you make it. And so um, you, you don't need everything right away. Um, and the startup costs can be kind of high in general. Um, but just keep in mind that after you get all of this, uh, really, you have all the tools you need. And really, the, mo the more common problem that I see is that people just start buying kits, and then they just accumulate these kits, and they don't even start building. So uh, <laughs> you usually end up uh, having more kits than you do time. So these, these supplies I'm about to show you guys though, these are ones I do deem essential. Uh, so I would highly recommend pretty much every single one of them. I use them for all of my kits. Um, but again, it's up to you what you feel is necessary and what isn't. So kind of not even numbered. Uh, if we're gonna start out first here with safety gear. So this is very important. Uh, there are toxicants and kind of chemicals and, and things that we produce in this hobby that can be dangerous to your health. And so it's very important to protect your health because that's really the only thing that we have. And so um, you will need an N95 mask for sanding particulates. Uh, we're all familiar with that now, so that shouldn't be too difficult to find. Um, a few masks, so kind of this bottom left here, is very helpful when you are airbrushing or getting rid of um, kind of any fumes from painting. So this protects you from fumes. It's different from an N95. Nitrile gloves are helpful not only to protect your hands, but to protect your kit when you're building because there are oils and kind of dirt and things that get on your hands that you really don't want to transfer onto the paint job or onto your kit. And the bottom right here, goggles, um, this is probably a little excessive, but I put it here because a couple of weeks ago, I actually had an incident where I was airbrushing uh, and I, I was spraying and I ended up backsplashing and getting lacquer thinner in my eye. And so since then uh, I have been using goggles. It's, it hasn't really added any problems to my work. Uh, and so I would recommend those just if you wanna be extra careful. So with that all said, um, I'm gonna start talking about all of these supplies. So uh, what we'll do is we'll talk about all the supplies and then I will uh, guide you guys through what it's like to build a kit, um, knowing that we have now talked about these supplies. So um, the first one is sandpaper. Uh, this comes in what's called various grits. So the number on the sandpaper indicates how rough the, the sandpaper is. So the lower the grit, the rougher that sandpaper is. And the higher the grit, the opposite is true. Um, the purpose of sandpaper is to remove any seam lines or tabs on the kit. I will show you guys what those look like. Um, and they can also be used to polish your paint job, especially at that very high grit. Uh, so, you know, if you're spraying and you get a little fuzzy or a dust in your paint, that's an easy way for you to sand it off is to use a high grit. I typically start uh, when I'm first, you know, doing the first prep step um, at around 400 grit, but I also use 800 to kind of polish it after that. Uh, resin is generally a pretty soft material, so I wouldn't recommend going any lower than that. Um, you can also use sanding sticks. I know those are very popular in uh, Gundam building um, and any sort of other sanding material that you have. The next thing that you'll need um, is a cutting blade and kind of along this also nippers or clippers. Um, and the purpose of this is to slice off thin seam lines. So again, that kind of stuff that I'll talk about, um, it's left over from the casting process. Uh, you can also use this to define details and there's also carving blades available, um, but those are more of kind of advanced supply. Um, but in general, you wanna be cutting away from yourself, make sure that you're using this tool properly so you don't end up uh, cutting yourself in the process. The next thing, um, which seems kind of funny, um, but it's a bath for your kit. And the purpose of this is not only to clean your figure pieces, but it also removes what's called mold release. And so during the traditional casting process, which is uh, using a silicone mold and pouring liquid resin into that mold, um, before you pour that liquid resin in, uh, typically this kind of chemical is applied into the silicone mold. And the purpose of that is because when that re liquid resin hardens, uh, it makes it easier for that figure to be removed from the cast. Um, and so what happens is this mold release really sometimes gets stuck on your figure. So you wanna make sure that you get rid of all of that. Otherwise uh, there's a potential that, you know, you could pull up your paint job or um, it can just kind of impact uh, your paint. And so any degreaser will work. Um, you know, some people I know use an ultrasonic cleaner that will work as well. Um, I use Simple Green, which is kind of a degreaser and all purpose cleaner. Um, but there's also hobby brand ones available um, and even like higher strength chemical ones. Um, I've known people who use purple powder or, or any uh, other type of thing like that. So all of those will work. You just wanna be able to remove the mold release. 
The next thing um, is a drill, a drill bits, and pins, which are typically either brass wire or magnets even. Um, the purpose of this is to hold your figure pieces together. So we don't just glue these uh, out of the box. There's usually some sort of stability in the middle of that piece. Um, and we do that by drilling into either side of the figure and fitting in a brass wire or a magnet. Drills can either be handheld, uh, so using a pin vise, which is this bottom image below, or an electric drill, um, either a hobby brand or even a Dremel, those will all work. Um, and really your bit and your pin size will depend on the project that you're doing. Every figure is different, you know, figures are cast in different scale, um, so it, it really depends completely on the project. Putty is the next uh, kind of prep material, and this serves several purposes. Uh, it's first used to correct gaps in joints. So if you have two figure pieces and you put them together and there's kind of a hole there, you can use putty to fill that in and make it a little bit smoother. Um, it also fills in any bubbles that are left over from the casting process. So sometimes air gets left in the mold um, and then that results in what's called bubbles. And so you'll kind of pop those bubbles or uh, put putty in them and it helps smooth your figure out. And putty can also be used to sculpt pieces, define pieces. You know, if you break pieces, it can be used to kind of refine them. So there's many types of putty. Um, all of them kind of serve different purposes. Next one here, masking tape and liquid, is actually used during the painting process, um, but I put it here beforehand uh, just because it fits this presentation better. Um, and so this is used to prevent paint bleed and spray. So what you do is you'd have paint um, on your figure, you'd put tape or kind of liquid mask, which is like kind of this rubbery type material, um, cover the paint and then spray again or you know paint over it with a, a paintbrush, pull that tape off, and then you have two colors on your kit. So this is more of a recommended supply it's not necessary on every single kit um, and thus the size and use of this material really varies depending on your project primer however is really necessary um, this improves your paint adherence and so uh, what we like to do is we prime you know and that way your paint has kind of this coating to stick to so it doesn't peel off as easily or scratch off uh, it can also be used to highlight remaining defects. So what we like to do uh, in this hobby is apply a kind of a thin coat of primer and then see if there's any seam lines or kind of bubbles or anything that we've missed. Um, and then after that, uh, we sand all that down, reprime and kind of go back and forth uh, until the figure is basically ready for paint. And you can see there's different types of colors available. Uh, really depends on your project and what you want to do. So I could honestly write an entire presentation on painting, um, but really the whole point of this obviously is to make your kit look nice, right? Um, and we have two methods that we usually use through this. Um, we can hand paint with paint brushes or airbrush. Um, a lot of times people end up using both depending on what's needed. I use both these days, but it's up to you. Um, there's also three main kind of paint types. Uh, these are lacquer, enamel, and acrylic. And the toxicity, kind of how, how dangerous they are to your health, this really varies depending on um, the paint as well. But all of them in general do require paint thinner. So this is a liquid or a solvent uh, that you mix in with your paint to either make it uh, brush on smoother or flow through your airbrush. So uh, your thinner type will de change depending on your paint type as well. Um, and in general, an airbrush is kind of more investment into the hobby. Uh, I typically recommend people start out with hand brushing because there's no guaranteeing that you'll even like this figure or like this whole process. Um, and so an airbrush, you know, you not only need the airbrush, but you need the compressor, you need the safety gear, you need the, you know, special paint, you need the eyedroppers, you need all of that. And so the costs can be quite high, uh, significantly higher than just buying a bunch of paint brushes and paint. Um, but a lot of people like the airbrushed look or they're maybe they're wanting to follow a YouTube tutorial and so uh, for that reason uh, that may be something that you want to consider it's completely up to you uh, this is again is kind of out of order but it looks nicer so I'm just gonna talk about it this way um, so glue obviously the whole point of this is to assemble your figure after you're done painting it um, I really only recommend a two-part epoxy glue there are tons of glues out there um, but I have been using this Bob Smith Industries five-minute quick cure epoxy glue for almost a decade now um, and it, it's always worked for me so I like it because you can mix it as much as you need and it comes out a little bit thicker than a regular CA glue so 
uh, you really uh, kind of minimize the risk of getting glue all over your figure. So I love this glue. I completely, if there's one product I'm loyal to, it's probably this glue. <laughs> um, the last thing that I would recommend, or basically it's essential, is sealer or top coat. This is a coating that you apply after your paint job. Um, and it serves two purposes. Uh, it protects your figure from scuffs or scratches. So these are very delicate pieces of, of figures and, and artwork. Um, and so you may still end up scratching your figure, but this helps kind of minimize that risk a little bit. Um, it can also be used to alter the reflectiveness of your kit. And so if you have, for example, a figure that's in a glossy bodysuit, uh, you may want to have the bodysuit glossy, but the skin not be glossy. It may want to be matte. And so you can use a top coat to make that skin look not glossy. Um, and that kind of adds more dimension to your figure. So that's a really cool way to um, make your figures look more alive. So for the last section here, I'm just going to walk you through kind of actually building a kit. Um, there's no video, but I'm just going to show you guys a bunch of photos uh, from a previous figure that I've built. I actually uh, built this figure completely live on Twitch, and so all of that is available on my website. If you're interested in checking that out, um, it's on YouTube. So this is the little maid kit that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and so before you even start building your figure, what I like to do is check the kit's condition. Uh, this makes sure that all the pieces are in the box, that nothing's broken, etc. Um, and so you'll get your figures again in a, a box or even a plastic bag. That's very common. A lot of times this will include a glossy photo or some sort of printout um, like this image that has all the parts and then uh, just the image printed on it. And I just lay everything out um, to make sure everything's there. You can see this figure has something interesting because it has two faces instead of one. So um, this is a good way to kind of uh, orient yourself and prepare yourself for the work going forward. So the first thing that you're going to do is take that sandpaper and remove any seam lines and tabs. And so these seam lines are the arrows that I pointed to. Um, and this is caused when a cast or so like a silicone mold is put together and it doesn't line up completely properly. And so what happens is the resin kind of the liquid resin kind of pours out and hardens and forms this line. And so we don't really want the line, obviously. So uh, we take some sandpaper and we kind of sand all of that down to make it nice and smooth. Again, I use around a 400 grit, um, but you can also go kind of up to 800 grit and, and go from there. Um, there's also electric sandpaper, like sanding tools, um, if you prefer to go that way as well. Uh, the tab is this kind of image in the, the bottom right with a circle. Uh, this is left over from the casting process. It's called a tab or a flash tab. And it's basically just material that you clip off with your clippers or your X-Acto knife and then sand down that area. It doesn't connect to anything. It serves no purpose. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. You may get tabs, but you also want to make sure that it is a, an area that you want to remove because um, there have been times where I've clipped something off and then I go, uh oh, like that was, I actually needed that. Uh, so check your parts list, check what the kit's supposed to look like. Uh, that will help you figure out if it's a tab you actually want to remove or not. So these two steps are kind of interchangeable. Some people wash their figure first um, and some people pin them first. I tend to wash first. Um, it's just how I've developed my method. Um, so you'll put all your pieces in your cleaner. Um, you know, anywhere between eight to 24 hours is probably fine. I usually leave them overnight. And then what you'll do is you'll wash them in the sink with a toothbrush or, you know, any of that might not be necessary if you have an ultrasonic cleaner, um, but that's just kind of the basics of how to do that. Uh, and then you'll pin your figure so uh, again your pin and size and your bits and all of that will vary depending on your project you can see this one is quite small I'm holding it with the back of my hand so uh, because of that I use some smaller brass wires to pin her uh, but she does have those two heads and so I actually installed magnets in the back of her head and her hair so I could kind of take that head out and change it out whenever I wanted to uh, during this time, I also like to put my figure onto the base and kind of figure things out. Um, and so uh, I think that's just really valuable because the last thing you want is when you've painted your figure, you kind of struggle to put things on the base and maybe you end up chipping your paint and it's just not a great time. So all of the prep work beforehand will really help you out in the long run in making sure that things assemble correctly. This is a very extreme example of puttying, but I wanted to show you guys how bad this can get uh, because there's really no limit to originals. You can get really terrible 
casts, you can get really excellent casts. This one was a little on the rougher side, as you can see. Uh, so any of the red here is actually putty that I've smeared onto the figure, uh, which I then sanded down to try to fit into any sort of bubbles. Um, and there are hundreds and hundreds of bubbles all over the figure, uh, which you know ended up being filled in with this putty. You can also drill out holes and fill them in with different types of putty. So this arrow is a different type of putty that I used uh, to fill in a larger hole that I drilled. So you're not limited to one type of putty. Thankfully, this figure did fit together pretty well, so I didn't need to use any kind of uh, two-part putties, which you kind of mix two parts together and then it's kind of a thicker putty. So yeah, this can happen. After that, after you think you've finally gotten everything all sanded and puttied and there it's pinned and all of that, it's time to prime your figure. Uh, so I typically, you know, prime with an airbrush. Um, there's also spray cans available. And then, like I said before, um, we usually make a first pass and then sand down areas that kind of didn't meet uh, the QAQC, I don't know how else to say it. Um, so sometimes there's scratches or maybe a bubble you missed or something. And so this middle photo here is me sanding down the figure with the high grit sandpaper. I think this is around uh, 1,200 grit. And then once that's sanded down, you can add another coat of primer onto it. Um, you just wanna be careful with how thick you're applying the primer coats uh, because the last thing you want is to spray, excuse me, really thick coats uh, and then you end up obscuring some of the details. What I also like to do during this time um, is prepare my paint mixtures and so I again airbrush and I do a lot of that um, by custom paint mixtures. So all of these vials are custom colors um, and we also like to spray onto plastic spoons because it's a nice kind of white glossy surface that shows off that color. Uh, and so we often joke that we have a spoon collection as well as a figure collection and I do. I have a whole cabinet area full of spoons. Painting is the fun stuff. So it's really kind of up to you what order you want to paint your figure in. I like to start with skin tone first as well as hair um, because I feel like that frames the figure and kind of guides the color palette for the rest of the thing. Uh, but I know some people that paint their eyes first and then go from there. Uh, I typically leave eyes last. So the order is completely up to you. Um, but these are just a couple of photos from the painting process. Um, Again, after you have applied your paint, uh, you want to make sure you seal it with a top coat because that way uh, you won't be scratching your paint and you can also change the, the kind of reflectiveness of how you want it. And so once your figure is completely, you know, top coated and ready, uh, it's time for assembly. So this is the final made uh, photos that I took. Uh, photography is a whole other beast, which is way beyond a 101 kind of session here. Uh, but really, I just wanted to show you guys that um, you know, your figure can look beautiful at the end and photography is also really important um, because nobody is going to see your kit in person or maybe a small group of people, uh, but everybody is going to see it online, right? And so if that, I think that it's important to show off the best version of your work that you can um, and something that you'll be really proud of. A lot of times I just go back and I end up looking at my photos and not even the figure that's sitting in my cabinet. So uh, very important. But no matter what, be proud of your work, right? Because you put so much time and effort and love into it. And so to kind of wrap this up, um, because it's a little cheese ball, uh, but here's just some advice that I wanted to impart uh, because I, you know, need to remind myself of it a lot of times and also other people. So the first one is to not fear failure. Uh, really the hardest part is just starting completely. Um, and we all start somewhere and we all make mistakes. I make mistakes on every single figure that I've ever built, even my latest figure, um, you know, things happen at the very end even, and it's just a matter of pushing through and redoing if you need to, but every, almost everything is repairable or fixable on these kits. So you can always um, keep going. Next one is to be kind to yourself. Um, garage kit building is not a race. It's a journey with yourself and your artwork. So don't ever listen to anybody that tells you you're not building good enough or fast enough or anything like that. Um, people who are starting this hobby now are way better than I was when I first started because there's so many more materials available. You know, there's uh, materials you're able to buy. You can follow YouTube videos step by step. So um, again, don't compare yourself to other people we're all on different paths here and the last one really is just to have fun like this is a hobby right there's no obligation to continue this and so if it gets too stressful if, if it's not a thing for you take a step back you don't even have to do this hobby so it might not be for you but at least you took the time and you tried to do it and you gained some new experience along the way 
And that's really all that I have. Um, again, I am Plum Workshop. Um, my website is plumworkshop.com. I have a ton of tutorials and uh, guides on my website, so I'd urge you to check it out. Um, I'm also <laughs> obviously Plum Workshop on all these social media. So if you have liked this presentation or um, just want to see more of my work, feel free to follow me. And I think that's pretty much it. Uh, so thank you so much for following if you've gotten to this point. Uh, here's a list of references, which I'll briefly show. Uh, but again, lots more resources on my website. And I'm always happy to chat about kits. So feel free to DM me or message me at any time. Um, I'd love to talk. Thank you so much and have a good one, guys.